Let's get started then. So what I'm going to talk about is our quantum grant. This is our $3 million NIH quantum grant to try to uh, uh, streamline uh, taking patients with acute large vessel occlusion stroke directly to the um, operating room to having their imaging done. And so this is kind of what we've been working on, believe it or not, for seven years, but actively doing the grant for about four. So uh, these are uh, the disclosures. This is funded by the NIH and also Siemens is involved. And we did do some um, uh, non-commercial hardware modifications to our angiographic system, and that was a it was really not hardware, it was software. It was to allow the multi-sweeps uh, to occur to obtain the data. And this is our team, um, including our uh, neurosurgery residence coordinators, the Iowa team, our team, and our Siemens people. And this is really what we're all working towards. So we get the patient with this uh, stroke, and we're looking to find uh, the, oops, I didn't do it, but the ischemic penumbra around it uh, and caused by a large vessel thrombus. Those are the patients that we're targeting. And that definition of large vessel is definitely changing. It used to be carotid and M1A1 and basilar and proximal P1, but it's almost any vessel we can safely reach is really, uh, and especially in an eloquent portion of the brain is what we're trying to salvage at this point. Now, this is really important because for patients with large vessel occlusion, endovascular thrombectomy will benefit most patients. And because of that, we need to really structure our care system to uh, improve the timely treatment of these patients. And you can make any vessel look good uh, even hours later, but if you've lost the downstream brain, you haven't done a lot. So our motivations for this project were to find out how we could save time. And by saving time, we were assuming that we were going to also improve outcomes um, and also to develop uh, advanced imaging that could be done right in the operating room to find uh, the thrombus, how long it is, how big it is, where's the oligemic brain, what portion is core, and uh, if we could see um, the collaterals that we uh, have. There's that. So what do we know? Well, we know that the length of thrombus is important for the probability of weak canalization. And this 2011 study we don't publish shows that after you get beyond three millimeters in clot length, the probability of recanalization falls off dramatically. When you look down to a clot that's about eight millimeters in length, there's virtually a nil chance that you're going to reopen that vessel. It won't spontaneous or even with TPA open. So when you get a long clot like that where the red arrow, that's the time when endovascular shines. And we know that time is important, particularly when you're looking at outcomes and for mortality. So over time, from onset to reperfusion, the favorable outcomes begin to drop, and the intracranial hemorrhage and mortality rates begin to rise once you get a little bit beyond seven hours, is that crossover point. And there is a 15 to 20 percent effect size for every 30 minutes that you're delayed. And this study showed that it was really the interval between the CT imaging to reperfusion that showed a negative association with clinical outcome. So the odds of achieving a good outcome was reduced by 26% for every 30-minute delay in reperfusion time. The next question to ask ourselves is, does comprehensive imaging add value? And this remains very controversial in the endovascular world. There are people who go from straight, non-contrast head CT straight to the operating room without any other imaging, um, and those that want the full package. But let me point out to you that the big major five trials showed that the percentage of good outcome, meaning modified Rankin scores of zero to two at 90 days, improved or was higher in the patients that had the most advanced imaging. Until you get over to Extend IA, my favorite trial, in which all of the patients had, 100% of them had the full packet of CT, CTA, and perfusion within four and a half hours, and they had 71% of those patients 
had a very good outcome at 90 days. Um, even projects like Extend IA that had dedicated people and were very motivated, um, there were still some pretty uh, long delays. And if you look in red, you'll see that CT to groin puncture varied from 71 to 138 minutes. And these are people trying really hard uh, to go fast. Um, and that accounted, that CD to groin puncture was 38% of the total time it took for reperfusion. So a place we can improve. Um, so we want an imaging from the, we want information from this advanced imaging to find the thrombus, to just to, uh, look at the core and, and penumbra, look at the collaterals. But the whole thing takes time. And so very uh, many people are reluctant to stop in the emergency room and have this done. They want to just go straight to angio. And, and if we can do this imaging in the operating room, then you are actually saving time because you're not stopping anywhere else. It's basically helicopter to the operating room. And you can still get all of that imaging in about a minute and reconstruct it in less than 10, about five minutes. Now, I hope this will play. Yes. So this is the uh, gantry swinging around in the angio suite, and you're going to generate a non-contrast head CT. You're going to get contrast-enhanced CT scans. Um, and this is intravenous injection, by the way, not intraarterial. Uh, you get time-resolved CTA, and you get all of the parameters of perfusion. And you get that all from one single intravenous injection. And we're doing this in the, in the study. So the purpose of our phase one grant was to take this data and compare it um, uh, this comb beam data and compare it to the standard of, of care imaging, which is multi-detector uh, CT that like we get in the emergency room. And then if this uh, imaging was comparable, then to determine if we had skipped the ED and just gone straight to the operating room, how much time could we have potentially saved? So uh, all of these images um, were reconstructed, and they were all uh, reconstructed to a temporal resolution of one second per image. So both of them were matched. And then the image volumes were de-identified, and they were matched for slice thickness, angulation, to make direct comparison uh, possible. And they were all processed with RAPID. Um, and then the uh, perfusion maps were randomized, so you didn't know if you were looking at comb beam or multi-detector. And three uh, blinded neuroradiologists assessed them, and they were looking for assessed quality of the images, uh, presence or severity of artifacts, adequacy, uh, the mismatch pattern detection, could you tell where it was? And then was there enough information from the data to make a therapeutic decision? And then they also recorded and compared stroke laterality for uh, diagnostic accuracy. And this is the recruitment from phase one. So between June 2017 and April 2019, to just under uh, two years, we had 939 symptomatic acute stroke patients admitted. And 226 of those were selected for endovascular therapy. And of those patients, uh, Thanks to some extremely robust uh, criteria of, of, from our IRB, we uh, recruited 54 uh, subjects that underwent the uh, experimental comb beam perfusion imaging. And of those 54, five subjects were excluded because they had a contrast injection failure. That was either uh, infiltration of the IV, and there was once where the, the actual injector failed. Uh, Ten of the patients were also uh, not analyzable because they either had severe patient motion or there wasn't adequate contrast for rapid software to um, actually uh, reproduce the maps. So we had 39 patients that we actually had successful imaging on for this initial evaluation. And the gender and stroke laterality and the ages of the patients, as you can see, uh, were uh, pretty standard for uh, patients uh, that presenting with acute large vessel occlusion that were not in the study. So this is pretty standard. Let me show you some examples of what we got. So on the left, where it says MDCT, that is the multi-detector. That's the kind of CAT scan you get in the emergency room. And on the right is the comb beam CT, and that's the type of CT you get from the angiogram machine. So as you can see in this patient, um, this patient uh, had a very short interval between the, the emergency room CT and getting to the angio suite, or relatively short. 
and you can see on uh, the pink areas um, are the areas of infarct, and the green areas are the ischemic penumbra, the things that we stand to lose um, if we don't uh, open up the vessel. And you look from the multi-detector to the comb beam, and it looks pretty comparable. And down below are the standard maps where you can actually see the matched uh, 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 CBF and CBV along with mean transit and Tmax for the area that's absolutely infarcted. So beautiful correlation in this uh, case. Here's another nice case where actually the uh, multi-detector thought there was a larger core uh, than the comb beam did, but still the uh, penumbra, there was still a larger penumbra to save and another pretty good uh, correlation uh, case. Uh, this example is for me to remind everyone that stroke evolves, and it doesn't even have to be a long period of time. If you have very poor collaterals, you can still be within six hours and have extremely uh, bad uh, evolving infarct because you just can't get blood there. So this is an 88-year-old lady two hours after she was last known well. She already has a, a fairly substantial infarct. And, um, and just the time began between getting her uh, uh, here, and I believe that her um, multi-detector, this one might have been a Meritor case, I'm not, I'm not quite remembering, but she continued to evolve that stroke into something that on the comb beam shows that she's evolved the stroke in that time frame. So we're, we can use this even in the angio suite if you're not getting a vessel open, you can do the perfusion, comb beam perfusion, and you can see, yes, the stroke has evolved. Now the penumbra is essentially non-existent. We've gone to complete, completed infarct, and we should stop. In this case was a pretty much stop case. Um, and this is a failure case. I wanted to show one of these because even though this is a failure, it's not a complete failure. Um, on the left is the multi-detector CT. You see that's a very large stroke, uh, core stroke with a slightly larger um, uh, penumbra, and this of course is dominant hemisphere, so we're going to try to salvage anything we can. And the comb beam CT, you see that you really can't, uh, there wasn't an adequate um, contrast uh, to actually assign the rapid, uh, you know, pink uh, core and green penumbra. But if you look at the regular color maps, you can at least see laterality. You get an idea of the size of the stroke and whether there's a penumbra there or not, so you can see that there's a large stroke. So even on a failure case, and this is a, a, a pretty pretty much of a failure, um, you still can glean some data. So the results of our phase one study was that the accuracy was for uh, diagnosing stroke was really high for both, as you would expect, multi-detector, but also for comb beam CT. And the inner uh, reader consistency was actually excellent. The capability scores of comb beam CT were not inferior to multi-detector when it came to being able to make a stroke diagnosis, detect a mismatch pattern, and make a decision for treatment. Um, with regards to time, going from the multi-detector to arriving in the angio suite was the most variable. Uh, anywhere from 15 minutes to over 90. The average time was 50 plus or minus 34 minutes. So we could have saved substantial time if we could have avoided being in the emergency room for many of these cases. And even though most of these cases were under 20 minutes, it's still, there are a, a huge spread here in terms of time. And from the time of arrival in the engine suite to the first arterial image was 21 minutes plus or take a few. And this uh, also, this is basically the patient hitting the room, not even on the table. So they are in the room, it gets recorded, they're being put on the angio table, we have to do a timeout, we get whatever anesthesia we need, whether it's you know, just uh, observation MAC or, or have to G, do, put the patient under GA. Uh, doing the IV comb beam CTP was really the least amount of time because it only takes about a minute to acquire. So even if you give it three or four minutes to set it up, it's pretty fast. And then getting a sheath in, catheter placement, and the first angio image. So all of that happened within 21 minutes as an average. And that's pretty good, but I think we can uh, save a little bit more time there in the future. So the summary for phase one was that comb beam CTP images were not inferior to the standard of care conventional multi-detector images. And we could save you know, anywhere from 30 to almost an hour of time if we could bypass the EB. So 
Oh, I don't know why that's making sound. Anyway, it has to do this. Where's the sound button? I don't even see it. Uh, so in order to go to, to, to direct to Angie, you gotta be able to do certain things. Um, and you have to identify intracranial blood. You have to be able to calculate an aspect score. And then you have to really quickly reconstruct that data and get it up into packs. And the old systems were 14-bit detectors, and that's why those CTs don't look that nice. But the newer systems like the Q and the Icono have 16-bit detectors. And this is actually good enough, in my opinion, to pick up blood for sure supertentorially, and I think even infratentorially most of the time. So this is a, um, uh, these are images from a paper from Leahy, and this is showing 16-bit detector. And remember that 16-bit is four times uh, more gray and white differentiation than the 14-bit detector, so much improved. And the A and the C are the cone beam CTs, and the B and D are the multi-detectors. And you can see where the black arrow is, um, that there is a small infarct in that left frontal lobe, and that's, that's an older one. So it shows up really well. And then where the arrowheads are is there's a subacute stroke in the right perisylvian region. And I see that much better on the multi-detector. I can pick it up uh, on, the, on the cone beam, but uh, multi-detector is a little better in that instance. And these are two studies from 2016, the ones on the left. Flat panel is the same thing as cone beam. Uh, so the flat panel detector, this is a Froelich's article showing that you could pick up for sure, parenchymal blood, no question, you can see that. But you can also see there's interventricular blood, even uh, blood layering in the occipital horn. And on the right is Leahy, again, showing a variety of blood patterns. There's some parenchymal blood. There's definitely subarachnoid blood um, in the uh, perisylvian region. And you look at the A and the C, that's the cone beam CT. And you can even see um, uh, in, the, in the cisternal spaces that there's some subarachnoid blood uh, in front of the brain stem. And so I can, you can see, I blew it up so you can see a little bit better where the black arrows are. But if you're used to seeing and looking at these cone beam CTs, you get very good at reading them pretty quick. And I don't think we'd walk past this. Now, this is one that I did. This is my patient. And the outer images in the red, you'll see a cone beam CT images, and the inner images are our multi detector CT. And this is after uh, I um, uh, recanalized her. So this is an 84-year-old lady who five years ago had a right perisylvian uh, stroke, and now she represented now with a left M1, M2 occlusion. And we did uh, thromboaspiration to a TIKI-3 pretty quickly. And this is her immediate on the table, post-reperfusion uh, cone beam CT. You can see uh, in the cone beam on that flanking uh, images that there is uh, blush or blood um, in the uh, caudate and in part of the um, uh, corpus striatum uh, uh, nuclei. And we took her for dual energy, and this is just contrast. There's no blood there. But I think if you look at the definition of the sulci, the ventricles, the blush, the old infarct, um, all of this is quite uh, uh, easy to see on the cone beam CT. So we're not ready to start phase two yet. Um, our, phase, our phase two has to, we have to do this bridging uh, first because we haven't proven that we can obtain and, and um, uh, re, um, process and integrate up into PACs in a really timely fashion. So we have to prove that before we can go to the true phase two. So, you know, direct to angio is a, definitely a standard uh, of care and imaging. And we have to convince our stroke neurology colleagues and ourselves um, that we can do this and do this well. Uh, we have to accurately and quickly reconstruct the cone beam CT. Um, so we're gonna do that in 15 patients. And these bridging, pa these 15 are from the phase one uh, that um, uh, were not be able to be included in that data. So the uh, IRB has allowed us to do this bridging. Um, and so they're gonna have both multi-detector and cone beam CT imaging. Um, and then we're going to have, uh, once they get the cone beam, they're in the room and we, and we uh, do the cone beam CT uh, perfusion imaging, 
then we're, the clock is ticking. You know, you obtain it and the clock is ticking and, and they have to get it uh, processed and up in the system. And the reason this is important to, to bridge like this is because if there's a failure in software or we can't get the imaging up, we have to then fall back on the multi-detector so that we treat these patients appropriately and correctly. Um, now, if they get to the angio suite, that means we're planning to, to, to do um, uh, thrombolysis. So uh, if everything fails, and it has in the, um, in the past, we've had patients down in the ED where the ID is just blown out, we can't get another one. We know they don't have a bleed. They've got an NIH stroke score of 22 or 24. We just take them. I mean, we just, you just take them. So that's always the fallback. But we're trying to actually match time-wise. If, if we can't get that cone beam data up and running within 10 minutes where we can actually read it, then we revert to the multi-detector imaging. I will say that known COVID positive patients are going to be excluded um, uh, from the phase two, and that's because phase two includes a 90 day outcome score. So uh, for the patients that come in, we have so many that are COVID unknown uh, that if they're uh, screen negative and they're unknown, we're going to include those patients and we can always exclude them later. The IRB has a pathway in where we can trade those patients out and keep recruiting. But if we know they're COVID positive and they're coming in with a stroke because they're COVID positive, those patients for sure will not be included. So this is the algorithm for the uh, bridging subjects. So we identify in the green box a patient uh, that needs to have a, um, that has a stroke and we think based on symptomatology, it's a large vessel. And they get to an emergency room and they get their non-con head and uh, they get or don't get a TPA. If they don't have any kind of additional imaging, then when they come to our shop, they're going to get the multi-detector full stroke deluxe imaging in the emergency room. And if they uh, do, like say they come over from Meritor and they already have that data, um, then uh, we just make sure um, that we don't have to repeat the CTA, but if they, if they have a CTP already, we won't repeat that either. They'll go straight to Angio. But if they have everything, lots of our shops do CTA, but they don't do CT perfusion, we will obtain that so we can compare directly. And then, you know, they depending on what that shows, depends on whether we do them. If they don't have a stroke, they don't have a large vessel occlusion, then they're going to stay in the emergency room. Um, if they do have a stroke and they have a large vessel occlusion, but there's no penumbra, obviously we have nothing to do. They can get a cone beam CT. Uh, we are allowed to recruit them just for imaging instead of just taking only people we're going to treat, but there obviously no thrombolysis would happen. And then the one that we hope we have is a patient has a large vessel occlusion, a large penumbra, a small stroke, and then they go to the operating room, they get their cone beam CT, and then we open them up. Um, and the same thing is true on the, on the orange side is, you know, if they don't have a penumbra, then they are eligible to be for the cone beam only portion. Um, but if they... Um, uh, basically have penumbra and large vessel occlusion, then we take them. So that's that's the flow chart for the bridging subjects. Now this is a really busy slide, so uh, this is just the, the flow chart for um, if we are successful with bridging and we have to prove that we can do it and do it you know frequently enough that it's safe to do this, um, then we can start phase two. And if we can't get um, our software to work correctly, then we can't enter phase two until we do. So once, once we've appropriately bridged, then we're going to go to the direct to angio portion, the one-stop shop uh, portion. So if you look on the right side, the workflow is that the patient arrives in an outside hospital, they get assessed, they get their not, at least a non-contrast head CT. Our stroke neurology is called, they accept the patient and transfer. And on arrival, the patient gets randomized two to one to either have the cone beam CT or have the standard of care imaging. And this randomization was requested. It wasn't in our original grant, but the scientific committee here um, felt very strongly that randomizing uh, have, and two to one was fine, that this would uh, have better robust outcomes and this was what they um, uh, recommended and required. So on the cone beam side, uh, Based on that non-con head at the outside hospital, they'll go straight to the operating room and we would do the timeout and whatever we have to do and obtain the cone beam CT and then assess them uh, for treatment based off of that. 
And if they had the correct parameters, then we would do thromboaspiration or uh, mechanical thrombectomy and we canalize them. Um, if they uh, randomized to multi detector, then they would go down the standard of care, standard of imaging uh, pathway, and they would come to the biplane if they had an appropriate lesion for recanalization. Um, the uh, goal is a very lofty one. We're going to try to recanalize, and uh, you know, from the ED door to recanalization, we're trying to get under 50 minutes. And we're hoping that at least on the uh, cone beam CT side, that's possible, but we're going to try to hit that same metric, uh, even with multi detector, because obviously the faster we go, um, the better we do. And of note, Dr. Dempsey knows about this. I will point out that uh, Don Fry's group, that they started using this new app to help integrate all of the imaging and all the teams. Uh, they were already getting under 60 minutes, and now they're under 40 minutes for some of their door to recanalization times because everything is already processed for them and everybody knows what their job is and they just go 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 so we're going to try to get under under 50 minutes uh, even with the multiple phone calls that we have to make under our current uh, protocol and there are a few inclusion exclusion criteria these are pretty much the same uh, as for phase one um, let me go back one thing the one thing i don't have down here is that at 90 days uh, a person not involved in the uh, treatment of the patient will be uh, evaluating the patient, uh, assigning them a modified Rankin score. Um, we're also going to get a uh, head CT so that we see two things. One, the final infarct, and then two, I'm, I'm always a little bit surprised when we send these people home with the plan and then something goes wrong and the plan's not implemented. And a few of these people are continuing to have silent strokes um, you know, just not in eloquent areas. And so I want to know that what the final stroke size was, that's their new baseline. And did they have any interval strokes that we did not know about uh, outside of that vascular territory? So in summary, uh, we found that cone beam CT perfusion images were not inferior to the conven conventional or current standard of imaging care and that we could have saved almost an hour if we'd gone directly to the angio suite. Um, there's lots of time saving uh, in all phases of stroke treatment that we need to take advantage of as well. And then phase two direct to angio will demonstrate whether the time that we saved actually translates out into uh, better outcomes. Now these are relatively small numbers. The NIH looked at our numbers. Their statisticians were happy with our numbers. The scientific committee here looked at the numbers, they were happy with our numbers. Nonetheless, what we basically said in our grant was, if this is successful, then we uh, would like to see a, a multi-center uh, trial on this, you know, and multiple places implementing the same thing. And our partners in Iowa are already ready to do that. But you need, uh, if you really want to uh, do a robust and strong outcomes, then uh, we need to do a, a little larger sample. Um, unless there's a marked difference, and then uh, the sample size we have will be fine. And that's what I have for stroke. Uh, this is a beautiful farm in Iceland. So talk fitter is uh, thank you. Uh, and that's the polite form of saying thank you in Icelandic. And I'll be happy to take any questions if I if there are any. Thank you, Beb. Thank you. Could you comment on the radiation dose? Yeah, so uh, depending on which machine uh, you do, um, uh, the, the radiation dose is actually uh, relatively low. Um, and we had to answer these questions to uh, for the um, NIH as well as our IRB. So the radiation dose is, is, uh, is not uh, um, a, a handicap in the sense of doing both studies. Okay. It, is, it is radiation, but it's within the acceptable range. And then all these calculations were done and it was acceptable. You know, like uh, my understanding, like comparable to half a CAT scan or something like that. Yeah, the cone beam CT is, is less radiation um, yeah. than so conventional the CT. And even multi-detector CT radiation doses, they've been working on those too. And they brought those down. I mean, if you go back to 20 years ago, the dose in multi-detector CT was much higher. It's, it's down by something like 40% or some, some ridiculously high number. So they've worked really hard on the multi-detector side 
changing protocols and algorithms. So both of them are down, but comb beam is, has a much higher resolution, has lower radiation dose. And when you compare room 10 to room 11, uh, what was the major upgrade with the newer machine and how does that affect this study? Well, the gantry speed is much faster mm -hmm. um, and the image processing, there's much better metallic algorithm and motion correction algorithms with that faster gantry speed so that you get much clearer, better images. And you can tell a real difference. Uh, I mean, the comb beam CT in the Q room is quite good. Um, even the Z is pretty good. But the comb beam CT quality in the Icono is the best. And, that, and that's because of the better algorithms and the faster gantry speed. And, and Icono it has a detector. It has a crystalline detector as well. And so that actually improves uh, image quality. And the Icono is in 10? Is that correct? The Icono is in 10. All right. We're working some Thanks. bugs out this week with it. So we have a Siemens guy here. And we'll be doing a couple of cases there tomorrow and trying to find out you know, if we have a how can we fix a few little problems? Yeah. I mean, this is pretty impressive that 10 minutes means a lot of brain. And yes. you know, this can be very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, I should point out that um, the, there's a couple confounders to this project right now. The biggest one is COVID uh, because we have people coming in. Our COVID room is set up for COVID patients or suspected or unknowns. And we can't, the gantry speed, while it worked for phase one, uh, it's really too slow for what we're trying to do now. So we're trying to do all of the strokes and the protocol for the bridging and in phase two, we wanna do them in Q and in Icono. And um, I'm hopeful, uh, and, and then the IRB has to say it's okay for us to resume. We've put in our request and I have not been given the green light and I think they've possibly slow down on that approval because we've been bumping so many more cases in Wisconsin lately. Um, but that's gonna be a difficult thing for us. We're either gonna have to take the stroke patients to uh, room 10 or 11, uh, even if we don't, you know, if they screen negative, um, we still have to COVID test them, but um, I, I don't know how that's gonna impact our bridging and our phase two start. So I imagine we're gonna have to, if they're screen negative, we're gonna, we have to clean the room, but it takes the room down for a longer period of time. So if we take a patient into, in 10 or 11, we have to clean it and then it has to be irradiated and it's like an hour and it's a big deal. So um, not sure okay. how we're gonna work that part out. Uh, thank you very much. Sure, any other questions? Hey Bev, it's Niall. I have, I have a quick question actually. Sure. Um, Thanks for the uh, terrific professor rounds. It's really great to hear about the, the study coming so far. Um, my question's about the bridging process and yes. um, the, the utilization of the uh, cone, beam, cone beam data. So if we are getting someone on the table and they're on the table, we take the cone beam, are we gonna be using that data uh, during the bridging process to make any decisions or is it just about acquiring well, we, that data, storing it away and moving we're forward? We're gonna use it. We're going to use it, but the the, t the clock is ticking. And the first five patients that we bridge are light of day cases with the engineers right there. Um, because uh, they've done this over in Wimmer, sort of, but they've never done this live. And I, I kind of insisted, uh, as the clinical PI, I kind of insisted that we had to have this bridge. I can't take someone in there having never tested the process and put them at that in that position. So the bridging was added in and we will, um, you can look at both, but our goal is to try to use the comb beam and I'll probably look at both, frankly, uh, just to, to convince myself. But the reason, the reason for having multi-detector is if, if, the, if the software uh, processing and the translation of the, of the process data into PACS cannot happen within 10 minutes, you can't wait any longer. I mean, you got to yeah. go. And so you have a fallback of your multi-detector imaging. But I'm probably going to peek at that first while we're getting the patient up there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because you had said that we would revert back to the uh, multi-detector if there were issues, of course. Yes, yeah. And, and it, say we uh, we pull up the cone beam data um, and we're, we have the patient on the table. At, at that point, they're getting an A-line in, getting induced most likely. Um, are they 
are we going to have radiology looking at the images as well, or will it yeah. just be our own interpretation? Yeah, this has been, well, we're going to be looking at it ourselves, but this has been uh, negotiated um, uh, with the neuroradiologists. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm also, uh, for Dr. Dempsey's benefit, I've reached out to the company that makes the new uh, processing uh, app that you and I were looking at. Uh, and I've also reached out to Guang Hong because that our software for um, processing the comb beam CT study uh, is proprietary and in-house. And I reached out to see with from both sides, would this be something that we could use the app for? And I won't know that for a while. But uh, that being aside, um, uh, at some point we, we want to be able to fly and not look at multi-detector and only look at comb beam. But I think in the beginning, I'm going to look because I need to, you know, our first responsibilities to the patient, you know, I mean, the study, yeah, we want to do a good study. We want to help all the patients in the future, but the patient on the table in front of us is where the focus is right then. And so we have to do the right thing by them. And, and so that's why uh, we have to do the bridging and um, the neuroradiologist will be reading certain portions of it. Uh, also, sub-analysis that we're going to do of this data is to look at the non-con head CTs on the outside with the non-con head CTs that are generated by comb beam. So that's one analysis. If we do uh, get enough COVID patients to make it a reasonable analysis, we'll look at our COVID versus non-COVID patients. I don't think we'll get the numbers for that, um, but, but it's something to look at. And you can see there's all this data that we're going to collect, and we can... Um, Sub and look at do a sub analysis on different areas. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you, Beth. Yeah. Right. The bridging does one other thing I should point out. Um, it's a you know I'm in I'm used to looking at comb beam CTs uh, because I've, I've looked at them for years now and now they're really getting good and I window them and I do all this stuff myself. But a lot of people haven't really gotten comfortable looking at them. And so the bridging, the 15 bridging patients are our teaching file. So because you're going to have multi-detector and comb beam done very quickly, uh, back to back. And so you train your eye to look at that comb beam and you use that multi-detector as the standard, so to speak. So you get more comfortable at reading CTA, you know, comb beam CTA, comb beam collaterals, comb beam perfusion, comb beam, you know, aspects. Um, and so that is something that I also thought would be very valuable for neuroradiology, for residents and fellows. Um, as you go out into the real world, you're going to get more and more comb beam data. And so this allows all of our trainees and all of us to get more comfortable looking at these uh, images. All righty. Okay, any other questions, comments? I think we're good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you much.